Welcome to the program, Cool Kids Cook. I'm Kid Chef Aliana, a cookbook author, foodie, and your show host. Here's what's happening with me. This episode is actually my four-year anniversary of Cool Kids Cook. I can't believe that. And this past weekend, I had a major brainstorm of lots of cool new recipe ideas, so tune in for more later. As you know, I've been staging at Commander's Palace, and it's been such a pleasure working with so many great people there. And I'll talk all about it in a bit. I'm also giving away Louisiana Cookin's cookbook, Louisiana de Mer. Check out my review of the book in Robin Newman's episode. To get a chance to win the cookbook, visit my Facebook page or Instagram for all the details. Now, I'm excited to introduce our fourth anniversary special guest, sommelier Mark Bitterman. A leading expert on artisan-made salt, chocolate, and cocktail bitters, sommelier Mark Bitterman has clientele ranging from top chefs to food manufacturers to home cooks. The sommelier is to salt what the sommelier is to wine, providing information and expertise that helps diners, chefs, and retailers to get the best possible result from their food, restaurants, and stores. Mark leads salt-inspired dinners at many celebrated restaurants and lectures at culinary schools such as the French Culinary Institute, the Institute of Culinary Education, and Le Cordon Bleu. Mark has been developing recipes and consulting with various chefs, restaurants, and culinary institutions since 2006. Mr. Mark, thank you so much for being a guest for my fourth anniversary on the show, and welcome to Cool Kids Cook. Well, thanks for having me, and happy birthday, or uh, show day. (laughs) Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Now, I am totally obsessed with salt, and I even have a whole shelf in my pantry that is dedicated to different salts from around the world. So when did your love for salt start? I, I think it started consciously, um, not until I was more of, a little bit older than you, but I think you're a faster learner than me in a lot of ways. Um, uh, I, but I really, when I first went to France, uh, and I was traveling around on a motorcycle, and I stopped by like a, a truck stop one day, and I ordered some food, and it came out, and there was this dazzling, shimmering kind of opalescent salt on the surface of the steak, and I took a bite, and it had this big minerally crunch, and it caught my attention, and I was like, what the heck? I'd never tasted anything like it. Wow. That sounds awesome. I mean, I love yeah, it's just... trying new salts. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you do, too. <laughs> Yeah, no, and I, and I, and I, you know, it was it was something that I just wasn't prepared. To. I, I never thought anything about it before, and you know, maybe who had really? It was, this was kind of a long time ago, and it wasn't really on my radar as a food. And so it was the, the discovery for me was was that uh, that a salt could have so much personality, could have so much character. And I actually met the. Uh, I, I jumped. I, I was riding on a motorcycle, and I jumped back on my bike, and I raced down to the salt works, and I. I met this guy who's working on this salt pan uh, that has been there uh, in the same place, the same way, uh, in the same community um, since the Trappist monks first finished making salt pans there in the 11th century. And <clears throat> it kind of just blew my mind. Like, this is this food that I never thought about that was so ancient and, and so unusual and, and so kind of rooted in, in, in people's uh, uh, histories and, and, and in their homes. Exactly. I mean, I love salt. Like I told you, I have a whole salt chef. Um, I always ask for salt for like Christmas and birthdays and things. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, what kind of well, new salt can I get? Or I'm at like a farmer's market and I see like all these gourmet salts and I'm just like, oh my gosh, I want them all. <laughs> I, now I know what to get you. And, and yeah, that's the, the beautiful thing about all these different kinds of salts is they really do all have their own personality. So you know, each one is different, and they each speak kind of differently and create a different, uh, a different uh, flavor or mood or or texture with food. Yes, exactly. That's really what I love about salt is you know everything that you're cooking or making, uh, you can put all different kinds of salts in it. Um, you know, just to make make it have like a different flavor. I mean. The, I love, mm-hmm. like, smoked salt. Um, that is just so great. I know that's, like, really trendy right now, um, but that tastes so great. Uh, there's so many different ones. I mean, the list could just go on and on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I love smoked salt, too. It's what, I, what I think is fun about it, I, I think about smoked salt for me is almost like a way to cheat because if I'm cooking something indoors, when I say it's raining or I'm too lazy to go outside, I can, I can throw something in the oven and then, I can sprinkle some smoked salt on top, and it tastes just like it came off the grill. 
but it's all natural. It's just the natural cold smoke flavor of the salt. Exactly. That's, I mean, that's really what I love about it. And, you know, I actually have your gold salt, which I know is also a smoked salt. It, like, it, you can just smell it. Um, and it's so awesome. It's, like, beautiful and crunchy, and it's so great. So I got it for my golden birthday, and since it was gold, I got that as a present, and I was <laughs> so psyched about it. <laughs> um, and I really love it on watermelon. And this morning, I oh, actually... Yeah. Put it on my toast. I made a whipped honey butter and put that on toast, and then I put the gold salt on top, and it just took it to a whole new level. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that sounds really, really fantastic. I, I'm, I, you know, the thing is, is, butter is one of these beautiful foods, and many people I find uh, tend to buy salted butter, which is is really unnecessary because <laughs> salt, the butter itself is actually a bit more flavorful and and and, and, uh, and, and on its own when you add the salt to it separately. The, the salt crystals have a chance to get that big bright crunch and and really kind of play off the flavor of the of the dairy. Um, if you think about it in a way, almost like like salted butter is actually um, almost like a processed food. You know, it's added in the salt even though they don't need to. Yeah, exactly. I never get salted butter. It's always unsalted. I mean, I don't know. I just think it's so much better. And whenever you have salted butter, sometimes it'll make something like way more salty. Um, yeah, so yeah. I don't think there's a need for it, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's actually one of the main things I like to preach to people is that um, you really you, you use unsalted ingredients as much as possible. That, that gives you full creative power, full creative control over how you use the salt. And if you think about it, if you think that recognize that salt is really the most powerful flavor enhancer there is. You know, it's more powerful than, than than heat. It's more powerful than spices. It's the one thing that really amplifies flavor. So if you use salt um, uh, well, if you use it appropriately, it's the easiest and, and most convenient way, really, to amplify to create more flavor in your food. So controlling it's the first step, right? You don't want some some uh, food scientist somewhere far away influencing how your food could taste and you want to do it yourself. Yes, exactly. That's, you know, that's a great thing. I always say that too, you know, you don't, sometimes you just need salt and pepper. I mean, that's basically it. I mean, it's great to have yeah. like, all the spices. I love spices, but you know, sometimes you just want to keep it really simple and it really lets, you know, your dish shine, you know, those flavors that mm. it already has. Now, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I go know, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, uh, I know that you... You get me excited and I keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Me too. I'm so excited. Um, now, I know that you also call yourself a sommelier. So can you please explain to our listeners exactly what a sommelier is and how does one become one? Sure. So uh, a sommelier is, is, is expert in salt. It comes from the word sommelier, which is a French word for a wine expert. And the, the purpose of a sommelier isn't just to tell you all about wine, like, all these facts and figures that don't really help you. The sommelier's job is also to help you find the wine that will really create the best experience for you in your meal. So it's about the marriage of the wine and the food. And so I take that same definition and apply that to salt. It's not about saltiness and different flavors of salt and different, and even, you know, all those, all those facts and in, in the stories of the salt, that's all fascinating. But ultimately, my job is for is to have people have a better experience eating. I want their food to taste better. I want it to look more beautiful. I want there to be more more exciting texture. Um, and maybe it's you know also these other these kind of secondary values. If you like natural, unrefined foods, you know finding salts that match that. So really, it's about finding the salt that will give uh, every cook the best tasting food every single time they eat. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, if I was stranded on a desert island and I could only take one, like, one food thing, I would, it would be salt. Like, that is the one thing. Yeah. Like, without salt, so many things just are just so bland. I, <laughs> I know. You know, the, the great thing about that is that if, if you got stranded on a desert island, the one thing that you could make yourself would be salt. <laughs> so you'd be all set. <laughs> I have no, I have, because you could just, you could, you could collect some seawater and, and, let it dry out and, and make your own beautiful salt. So I actually don't have any fear at all of getting stranded on desert islands because I know I'll be okay with my salt supply. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> we'll just make sure we, we'll have a special island just for you. <laughs> That's, we need to have that. That should be a chapter in a book or something. It's like, so you find yourself stranded on a desert island. It, don't, it's not all bad news. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're you always have salt. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Now, I also know. I mean, I also like really love um, you know various salts. So, can you talk about the differences in various salts and like what the difference is between table salt and finishing salt? Yeah, that's a really good question. That's really the core of the, of the matter. So the way I like to start is with, 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 with the whole idea is that you, you think about the fact that you know food naturally has lots of different variety, right? There's, you know, there's millions of different kinds of tomatoes and different kinds of apples and different kinds of cheeses, and all these different foods come in all these different times and all these different styles and types. And you think about it, salt is no different. It is made in every corner of the world by every different imaginable culture in every different imaginable environment from different oceans under different weather and frankly for different reasons for different end purposes so all of these salts are being made all over the world there are actually many thousands of them so what's cool is that every single one of those salts is different they all have different qualities just like any natural food so what i like to do is look at the different qualities of each salt and see like well, what would that do here what would that do there so for example some salts are very very fine and granular and delicate, these tiny little microscopic little crunchy crystals and fissures. And they have, and, and when you bite, you get this kind of shimmering, delicate, glittery sense of salt. It's just very subtle, but it's kind of pops and little bits go and then bigger ones, and it's, it's just, but it's just subtle. Other types of salt crystals might have big, chunky, minerally, big, chunky crystals that are moist and, and, and when you bite they go they give you this big explosive crunch but you get a lot of salt so very different from the first one so you think about it you might never want to put that big coarse chunky salt on some you know steamed green beans because you're going to get this big bite of salt but you put that on a big juicy ribeye steak and that burst of saltiness playing off the flavors of the meat could be tremendous so what i do is look at all the different styles of salt in the world, and I break them down into different families, just a very small handful of different families. And then we create rules for how to use the different families of salts in different kinds of cooking. And the result is not just a little bit of an improvement in flavor, it's a, it can even be like a mind-blowing improvement in flavor. Yes, totally. I love that. I mean, I love, you know, the way you described it. I, you know, one of my favorite one um, of salts that I have would have to be like Himalayan pink salt. But I also, you know, also love like a Florida de Sel and Malden. Uh -huh. um, I have like French yeah. gray salt. I mean, I have so many. It's so awesome. So I love collecting new so, ones and, you know, trying out on different, I, uh, different foods. Well, I love, I love, see, I love how, you know, I know that you've been cooking a, a long time and you cook really seriously. Even if you have fun, you're still pretty serious about it. And what's so cool is you just named, your four top salts you just named are, are one great representative from each family of salt. You mentioned Fleur de Sel with the delicate crystals. You mentioned the gray salt with the coarse crystals. You mentioned the Malden with the parchment fine flaky crystals, my favorite salt in the world for salad. And you mentioned the Himalayan pink salt, which could be great for baking and also really good ground up fine on top of popcorn or homemade potato chips. Yes, I love it on that. It's, you know, I feel like it's <laughs> such a subtle flavor, but it but it does still has so much flavor. It's incredible. I mean, we could just go on and talk about salts all day. <laughs> I know. We, we should just have the salt show sometime. You and me. We'll totally. <laughs> well, all salt shit. all the time. <laughs> Well, shake it like a salt shaker. We'll be right back. I'm Kid Chef Eliana, <laughs> and you're listening to Cool Kids Cook.
four, three, two. Welcome back to Cool Kids Cook. I'm Kid Chef Eliana. Let's continue our interview with sommelier Mark Bitterman for my fourth anniversary show. Well, let's find out more about you personally, Mr. Mark. What's your favorite dish to cook, and what's your favorite dish to eat? Ooh, I do. You know, as much as I love cooking, I do love eating more. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, that's always fallen, in, and so I actually love when other people cook for me. <laughs> um, and and what's funny is I'm so unfussy when someone else cooks for me. I love almost everything that people make. I'm really uh, I love very simple food like uh, like fresh salad. And um, I, I guess I think that probably my favorite thing in the world any day of the week. I don't know. I'd probably have to go all the way back to like something that my mom used to make me. She used to she used to have a really beautiful garden back in Santa Barbara, and. She would just have all these gorgeous, fresh, like like almost meaty, sweet tomatoes and 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 vegetables. And she'd make me a, and it's funny because by the way, I'm, I'm a real meat eater. But I, my favorite dishes are always going to be vegetable dishes. Um, and she would um, she'd do that, and she'd take um, there's all these fresh vegetables and make a big sandwich out of them on on homemade bread. Mm. And then I would sprinkle. And it's so funny because even before when I was a kid, I never never thought about salt. I would sprinkle salt on top of that sandwich. And I always thought it was like the most decadent, like treat. Like I was like the most special guy in the world. Cause I had all these things fresh out of the garden, and my mom made this big stack on that kind of like really yeasty, warm homemade bread. Mm. And I, to this day, I, I swear it's one of my favorite things. That sounds so good. I mean, you can't go yeah. wrong with just a really good sandwich, you know? A, yeah, you can't. It's so it's... good. <laughs> and probably one of my favorite things to cook. Um, I, 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 I guess what I would say, cook, I, I like to have a little bit of like wow factor for people. I like, I like to give people something that makes them feel special. In, in addition to being delicious, I, I something, sometimes like to just make them feel like, wow, you really, this is a special night. And so one of my favorite things to do is a really beautiful dish um, that's very, very easy, but, but it's really impressive. Um, and it's, it's called a rib steak in a salt crust. So you take a big like a three inch thick or four inch thick uh, cut of steak and you sear it and you lay it down on a bed of salt and then you pile uh, salt on top of it. And I use that beautiful coarse gray sea salt you were talking about that you have in your, on your shelves. So it's a gorgeous, natural, very mineral rich salt. And I put that on it and you stick it in the oven and you pull it out about 30 minutes later. And this, believe it or not, the steak does not come out salty. It comes out beautifully moist with this kind of deep, rich, full flavor. And you, you carve it into thick slices and, and serve it. And then you can even serve more salt because it's not very salty. Um, and that's one of my favorite dishes. I, I, it's, it's homey and warm and simple that makes people also feel like they're really being taken care of. And it's a special occasion. Wow, that sounds so good. <laughs> I could totally eat that right now. <laughs> Uh, it, it, it's so good and so easy, and and you know it's it's and it's an old recipe. It's one of the things I like about it. It's, it's actually um, it's like it's basically a medieval recipe. It's very simple, but um, but still tastes kind of contemporary and beautiful. Yes, exactly. I mean, I love that. You know, I love when you have you know simple ingredients and you make just a really simple dish, but it just has so much flavor. I mean, those are mm. the best. You know, you can make it just boom, 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 and then all of a sudden you get this awesome thing and everyone's like, what? This is crazy. How would you make yeah. it? You're like, oh, it's so easy. They're like, no way. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of that just comes out of, you know, it's that just sort of respecting your ingredients. When you really let the ingredients shine, it's often one of the most amazing ways to cook because if, if it's good, it'll blow people away. Yeah, um, totally. And it's actually one of my things to, about salt is I think that, you know, using any ingredient should matter. You know, every time you'd make a, a, a choice in the supermarket, you want to make sure that you're buying something that, that, you know, you believe in. Even, you know, we all have our economic limits and what our stores carry, but ultimately you buy the best thing that you think you can for, for your meal. And one of the things that I love about salt is that you can buy the best salt in the world. We have crazy sea salts that are made from seawater 3,000 feet under the ocean off the coast of Japan and evaporated in greenhouses. And, and they're beautiful and they're rather uh, and exotic. But even that salt costs less to use than a single slice of cucumber. So I love, I love 
treating yourself to a really high quality salt and it, and it, it does make your whole meal shine even though it still could be a very simple meal yes exactly totally well now can you share with our listeners your funniest or most disastrous food memory Oh my God! Disastrous! I have. I, I'm the master of disaster <laughs> in the kitchen. Um, so I had to think about one of the most recent ones. Um, I think one of the things I, I, I've done. Um, uh, there's probably. It's a good question because there are so many neat disasters. Um, probably one of my favorite ones ever. Oh no, this is funny, and I swear, to, I swear, I'm not. Um, I'm not. This is actually a thing that happened. It's going to sound like a joke, but but way before I was ever interested in salt, I never paid any attention to salt. Um, when I was a kid, I would bake a lot, and I and I and I would research. You know, this is before the internet, but I would like find a recipe in a magazine or something. And there's a beautiful recipe for basically. It looks like making cookies out of play-doh, and you'd make all these different colored doughs, and you'd weave them. To, you'd put food coloring in, and then you'd weave them together, and. So I made all the, I got all these beautiful strips of dough, all these different crazy colors, and and I made all these cookies in all these different ways. And and my mom had a, a big dinner party that night, and I was making the dessert for it. And they come out, and they serve the dessert, and people took a bite of the cookie, and the cookie, oops, I had put salt in instead of sugar. <laughs> the entire cookie tasted like a big puck of salt that was colored with food coloring. It was so horrible. Um, I'm actually surprised I wasn't traumatized for life and steer clear of salt for the rest of my life. <laughs> well, yeah, that you know that's something that's actually pretty common where people mistake sugar and salt. I mean, I know my sister yeah. did that once with a cake. Um, I mean, it happens. <laughs> it does, but it's oh boy, you don't want to do that. And and and, and hopefully that's that's that, that, there's your side benefit, right? If you have salts that are really unusual character, then the crystal will never uh, uh, will always look very different than sugar. So it, it, it's insurance policy against making that mistake. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now, let's talk about unusual foods. What's the most unusual food you've ever eaten? Is there food you would never eat again? Oh, geez. You know, I've eaten a I, So I, my approach to food, because I work with it for a living, is that I will absolutely never not eat something if I'm offered it. Um, so I, I, I have to do that because even if I, if it's freaking me out, you know, I don't really love really gelatinous weird food sometimes and I have my own issues, but, but, um, I, I've always tried to step up and just give it a shot. And so I think the thing that, um, I, I still have tremors of, of, it still upsets me to think about is, um, I, I did taste, um, this, um, um Icelandic, uh, dish that's made out of fermented shark and it's little cubes of it's shark that's put, stuck into a vat and fermented and it starts to smell really strongly of ammonia <laughs> like like that really strong overpowering smell of like windex but even worse <laughs> and and you're supposed to then to eat a little cube of this with a little shot of aqu- aquavit or with a stack or something and it's supposed to be good and I've had I tried I think three bites before I started to feel like I was going to pass out. I think I started to turn blue. Um, and I so I still recommend you try it if you get the chance, but don't 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 expect to like it. <laughs> well, I know that you'll never be having that again. <laughs> no, you know I love to be open minded, and I and but sometimes you just have to say, Uncle. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't think I've had any experiences like that, but I, I've had, I mean, some pretty weird foods that I might not want to try again, but I might, I mean, <laughs> nothing yeah, as bad know, as that, though. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you know, sometimes you just, like, you know, I used to, when I, I think when I was little, I didn't like things like, like the, the you, know, you, you, you know, you know your southern food, and I would maybe be afraid of the, the heads of shrimp, <laughs> and now it's like, bring it on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, now, lastly, here's a wacky off-the-wall food question that I've come up with just for you. If you could be any salt in the world, what would you be and why? Ooh, that's a hard one, but, but I think I have a, a fun one. I think I know what I would be. Um, there is a salt, uh, and I'm, I'm, uh, there's a salt called Amphist uh, 9X. 
believe it or not. That's the name of it. Amethyst, uh, Amethyst Bamboo Salt 9X. Uh, very impressive name, I know. Um, what it is, is it's salt that from the sea uh, uh, off the coast of Korea and is put into a canister of bamboo and capped with yellow clay and stuck in the oven. And then it's after it dries out, they take it out and they do that again. And they do that process over and over and over again. And each time uh, the, bam- the salt is absorbing all these properties from the bamboo and from the yellow clay. And then the last time they put the, that salt into a kiln, literally into a furnace, and they melt it down like lava. And then it recrystallizes into these crazy, gorgeous, amethyst-colored crystals that you grind up. And the flavor of it is like nothing you've ever tasted before. It has this flavor. Um, it is definitely shocking to taste, but it is amazing. It tastes like eggs, kind of, like the sulfury, eggy flavor, and also this kind of savory, umami flavor that's kind of like brothy flavor. Those two things combined. And when you put it on food, it turns it, it just turns it into something crazy. So I, I love that salt the most, and I, and, I, and I thought about it. What made me laugh about it is it's the salt that I think if, 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 if you were a dragon and you wanted a salt to season your human beings with before you ate them, you would pick the salt. <laughs> well, that, that sounds just a, like some just a crazy pretty salt. crazy salt. I mean, and I mean, that's a good one to pick. I, there's so many salts, so... Wow, that's awesome. I've never heard of that, but um, that sounds like it's great. I mean, it even looks really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and you know the funny thing is, well, I'm kidding around, but one of the reasons I would pick it, actually, is also not just because it sounds so kind of kind of ornery and, and weird, but also it is a very bal- – it's designed um, according to these Eastern uh, principles of, of creating food to be very balanced because it creates elements of, of – of, uh, of the plants and of water and of earth and of wood, uh, or I guess that's a plant, and of steel. All these different elements are supposed to be infused into it. So it has some sort of a holistic naturalness to it or, or, or completeness to it that I think sounds exciting to me. If I was a salt, I'd love to be that complete. Wow, that's, that's awesome. I totally would want to try that. <laughs> Well, well thank I, that you. can happen. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Mr. Mark, for being a guest on Cool Kids Cook for my fourth anniversary. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. I loved having you on. Well, you've shown us that the world of salt is an exciting one and that the right salt makes a meal truly special. If you want to find out more about sommelier Mark Bitterman, visit KidChefAliana.com for all the links. Grab some artisan salt while we take a quick break. I'm Kid Chef Eliana, and you're listening to Cool Kids Cook.
Kid Chef Aliana, and it's Cool Kids Cook with my fourth anniversary show. It's time for a tisket, a tasket, what's inside my basket? Today's secret ingredient is lavender. Let's talk about lavender. The name lavender comes from the Latin verb lavar, which means to wash. The lavender bud is covered in tiny hairs that contains its essential oils. The lavender plants are usually blue or purple, but some varieties are even pink or yellow. Nectar from the plant is actually used to make really good quality honey. In ancient Egypt, lavender was used in the mummification process. Lavender oil is used to reduce anxiety and stress and to induce sleep. Here is a recipe for my lemon thyme lavender lemonade. Now this is a very refreshing and tasty lemonade that's a perfect summer treat. Ingredients 1 cup of simple syrup 1 teaspoon of culinary lavender 6 cups of water 4th of a cup of lemon juice and a handful of lemon thyme. Directions Add culinary lavender to the simple syrup and let it sit for 10 minutes. Strain the simple syrup. In a large pitcher, add water, simple syrup, lemon juice, and lemon thyme. Mix thoroughly and serve cold. Optional, let it sit in the refrigerator overnight to allow the herbs to infuse the lemonade. You can find all of these recipes on my website, kidchefaliana.com. If you have a shh secret ingredient you'd like me to talk about, you can email me at eliana at kidchefaliana.com. Or call my U.S. toll-free number, 888-721-5915. Leave me your first name, where you're calling from, and your question. Maybe your suggestion will air on a future episode. It's time for Foodie News. I will give you an update on new food trends, cool cooking info, and the occasional strange food story. A new app called Tender was recently created. Users swipe left or right on images linked to recipes. If you swipe right, the recipe is saved to your cookbook that you can access at any time. And this cool app also has filters for pork, beef, seafood, vegetarian, vegan, desserts, and drinks. McDonald's may potentially have a national launch of all-day breakfast. In San Diego and Nashville, they tested all-day breakfast there, and the results were encouraging enough to warrant national preparation. Serving an all-day breakfast would be complicated for franchises to execute because there are too many ingredients between the lunch and breakfast menu. Now, it's not guaranteed that the national launch will be official, but everyone is getting ready just in case it does happen. At the Colorado Cherry Company, a bear broke into the back window, leaving paw marks everywhere, and climbed into the store. It then ate 24 cherry pies, 14 apple pies, a sack of sugar, and baking soda. And on its way out, the bear tried to take off with some to-go boxes, but dropped them in front of the store. And somehow, through all of this, the clever bear even avoided security cameras. <laughs> and that's this week's foodie news. Hey, kid foodies, I'd love to hear from you. Tweet me, I'm at Kid Chef Aliana. Send me your questions and ideas, and we'll connect. I'm also Eliana Cook's fan page on Facebook. On Instagram and Pinterest, I'm Kid Chef Eliana, so you know where to find me. You're listening to Cool Kids Cook. This is Kid Chef Eliana, and it's time for The Cookbook Shelf. In this segment, I'll read the latest cookbooks and share it with you. Today's cookbook is Diva Cooking, Unashamedly Glamorous Party Food, written by Victoria Blashford Snell and Jennifer Joyce. Now, this is a great cookbook for glamorous and delicious food that is actually simple to prepare as long as you have a few tricks up your sleeve. So, it's got all different kinds of dishes in here that are great for parties such as canapes, tarts, and even exquisitely presented plates of meat and fish dishes. So, these are all recipes that you can make for your own parties and for each recipe there are tons of cooking and serving tips and there's even hints in here on how to cut corners and plan your preparation um, there's ideas on how to adapt each recipe to make the most of seasonal ingredients there's advice on cooking techniques and even inspirational garnishing suggestions so this is really great it's got so many different awesome recipes that sound so awesome oh my gosh there is a lavender honey mascarpone creme brulee i totally want to make that now <laughs> oh my gosh it sounds so amazing 
Oh, there's phyllo tartlets of seared duck with sweet tomato and sesame chutney. Heavenly chunky chewy chocolate cookies. Uh, Korean barbecue chicken with cucumber salad. Wonton cups of Chinese chicken salad. Brochettes of lemon chicken, sage, and croutons with red pepper aioli. Oh my gosh. And the food pictures in here are just gorgeous. They are so beautiful. I love all those. Roasted winter vegetables and a fragrant coconut sauce. Wow, these look so awesome. Grilled red peppers stuffed with herb ricotta and black olive vinaigrette. Wow, there's so many awesome things. I could totally eat all of them. I love the food styling as well. It's so clever and cute and it just looks so beautiful. Like, I would love to see these like at a party. I mean, if I saw this at someone's party or even if I'd made that, I'd be like, well, that's just crazy. I can't believe like someone would make that. They look so gorgeous, and they look so tasty as well, and I love that. Wild mushroom and smoked mozzarella tart. Oh, my gosh. Caramelized red onion and fennel tart tatan with olives and thyme. Wow, this just sounds so great. I could eat, like, every single one of these recipes. <laughs> so you should definitely check out this cookbook. It's definitely fabulous, um, definitely for divas <laughs> so check that out now um over the weekend i had a total like random brainstorm um of like all these cool recipe ideas i don't know like where they came from <laughs> but all of a sudden i was like getting ready to go to bed um and then my brain just like exploded with all these different concepts and I was just like oh my gosh these are so great I need to write them down so like I took my phone and I went into my notes and I just started typing all of these different ideas that I had and I just maybe came up with I don't know like 10 different ideas or something it was just <laughs> crazy actually I was just kind of scrolling on my phone I saw an article about whipped feta and I was thinking like oh my gosh I loved whipped feta I want to totally make whipped feta again I love it so much what would be great with whipped feta and then I don't know I just came up with these cool ideas that um I'm totally obsessed with and a lot of these I want to literally just make them all um I actually thought of a whipped feta and curried goat on crostini I mean, that just sounds so good. I had curried goat before, and it tasted so amazing. I thought that that would be really great. Um, <laughs> I came up with a whole bunch of other ones. Um, so I'll probably try and uh, create all of these um, at some point and share recipes with you. Um, I actually got a Food & Wine magazine in the mail, and I just started flipping through the magazine and reading it and I was just so inspired from all these different um just pictures and di the different things I saw in there and I was just like oh my gosh I love it and so every time I saw something I love I like um dog-eared the page and like just marked all these pages practically every page in the book <laughs> and I even like wrote all inside the magazine like different ideas so I'm gonna have to write those in my notes as well so <laughs> I have so many I want to totally want to do. And I also made some mini chicken pot pies um, that I was inspired by my leftovers that I had. And I'll give the recipe in the next segment. So I made those and they tasted really great. And I'm super excited about this. Well, create some new dishes. We'll be right back. I'm Kid Chef Eliana and you're listening to Cool Kids Cook.
I'm Kid Chef Eliana, and it's time for Figure Out This Food. I have a game on my Facebook page called Figure Out This Food. I post a close-up of a food item, and the first three guesses get a shout-out here. Congratulations to Sokwin Chow for guessing sweet potatoes. Let's talk about sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are actually roots, not tubers. George Washington grew sweet potatoes on his farmland in Mount Vernon, Virginia. George Washington Carver is a famous scientist that created 118 products from sweet potatoes. Some of the products include glue for postage stamps and starch for sizing cotton fabrics. North Carolina produces 40% of the United States sweet potatoes. That makes sweet potatoes the official vegetable of North Carolina. It's snack activity time. Here I give you fun, easy breezy snack ideas. Today's snack activity is... Banana ice cream. Now, this is the simplest ice cream ever because it only takes two ingredients. <laughs> ingredients. Two bananas peeled and cut into chunks and two tablespoons of milk. You can use almond, soy, or whatever milk you want. Directions. Place banana chunks on a plate and freeze for two hours. Remove frozen banana chunks from freezer and place in a blender with milk. Blend until smooth and creamy. Serves two. Optional. Fold in chocolate chips, peanut butter, nuts, etc. You can even top the ice cream with chocolate syrup and sprinkles. Hey young chefs, this is Kid Chef Aliana and it's time for Creative Cuisine. This is a recipe for my mini chicken pot pies. Now this is a great recipe that I created using leftovers from the night before. Ingredients. 2 tablespoons of butter, 2 tablespoons of all-purpose flour, 1 cup of chicken broth, 1 cup of milk, 2 cups of roasted chicken diced, 1 cup of roasted carrots cut into small chunks, 1 cup of roasted potatoes diced, salt to taste, and 2 sheets of puff pastry thawed. Directions. Preheat oven to 400 degrees. In a large pan over medium heat, melt butter. Add flour and stir until thoroughly combined, creating a roux. Add chicken broth and milk. Stir until combined. Mix in roasted chicken, carrots, and potatoes. Add salt to taste. Place six ramekins on a baking sheet. Pour mixture into the small ramekins. Cut puff pastry into circles about a fourth of an inch bigger than the ramekins. Place circles over ramekins. Press the puff pastry to the sides of the ramekins so that they stay in place. Cut four slits in the shape of a plus sign into the top of the puff pastry. Bake in the oven for 15 minutes. Serves six. It's time for kitchen crafts. Here's a fun kitchen related craft. Today's kitchen craft is how to make giant paper popsicles. Supplies. Colored cardstock, scissors, glue stick, and giant popsicle sticks. Instructions. Step one. Cut colored cardstock into the shape of a giant popsicle. Step two. Cut different shapes such as circles, squares, and zigzag lines for your popsicle. Step 3. Glue the shapes onto your popsicle to create cool designs. Step 4. Glue the giant popsicle stick to the back of your giant popsicle. Enjoy your creation! The instructions along with photos are on my website for this week's episode on KidChefAliana.com. Don't forget to connect with me on Twitter and Facebook. I'm at KidChefAliana on Twitter and Eliana Cooks fan page on Facebook. Be sure to hit that like button. I like you and I hope you like me too. If you're listening to the show on iTunes, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the show. The more reviews we get, the more young chefs we can reach. And remember, my Parent Choice Approved Award Winning Cookbook and a Latino Book Award Winner, Cool Kids Cook Louisiana, and my newest cookbook, Cool Kids Cook Fresh and Fit, are available at any online book retailer. Now, as you know, I have been staging at Commander's Palace, and it has just been so spectacular. I love all the experience I'm getting there. 
it is just such a great place um, to stage. And, you know, even though I'm, like, cutting vegetables all day and doing all sorts of other things, I think it's still really fun. So um, most of the time I just uh, cut lots of vegetables and I help make um, the family meals. So um, we have something different every day. Um, so one of the family meals that was actually my favorite was when we um, did hash browns and grits and eggs um what else did we have we had oatmeal with craisins in it and oh and a sausage links and it was just so good <laughs> i loved it oh my gosh i especially love the hash browns because um i julienned uh onions and bell peppers for it and then we also had andouille in there that um is house made there and it was just so good. Oh my gosh, I love that. So they make really great um, on Dewey. Um, they make great boudin there. Um, so I've learned how to make that and their turtle soup and all kinds of other awesome things. So I really love, you know, getting to learn all these different things. And um, I, <laughs> I actually was on their Facebook page um, and they took a picture of me uh, in the kitchen, and they posted it to their Facebook, so I thought that was really cool. Um, so you can see that on my Facebook page. I also shared it there, uh, and that was just really fun. So I loved, you know, seeing that and you know being really excited. And everyone loves me there, and I love being there too. So you know, it's mutual. <laughs> we all love that. <laughs> Well, that's all for this week. I leave you with this quote from Paper Towns by John Green. If you don't imagine, nothing ever happens at all. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Kid Chef Eliana with Cool Kids Cook. Bon appetit. I'll see you next week.